Well, we consider now the uh, study of the motion of the planets and the orbits of the planets by Kepler. Um, we're again in around 1600, and we have the uh, background that we've already talked about, that uh, Tycho Brahe measured angles to uh, planets from stars and kept good records of those measurements. And really that data formed the basis of uh, further advance in our knowledge of the nature of the orbits of the planets in our solar system. Um, Kepler was uh, Tycho's assistant. Kepler is very good mathematically. And after uh, Tycho died, Kepler came to uh, possess the, the data, the observations. That's a whole story in itself and the, the drama on how Kepler got that data. But um, Kepler analyzed that data and he was able to form three laws of planetary motion. And these laws are uh, very useful to us as we consider the motion of the planets in the solar system. Of course, the, the Greeks had the idea that the circle was the perfect shape. Um, Kepler discovered from analyzing Tycho's data that the planets actually move on elliptical paths and the sun is at one focus of the ellipse. So we're not going to go into ellipse geometry in detail, but uh, it's an oval type shape, definitely not a circle, um, as for the one that's illustrated here. And there are two foci, uh, special points in uh, analyzing the ellipse. Uh, so one focus of the ellipse is occupied by the sun. The other focus of the ellipse is empty space. There's nothing there. Um, the planet then moves around on this path, an elliptical path, not a circle, and the sun is at one focus. So ellipses have a... Uh, a measurement, a characteristic called eccentricity that reveals the shape of the ellipse. If the eccentricity is zero, the ellipse is a circle. And if the eccentricity gets larger towards one, the ellipse becomes more and more elongated. Um, and a conic section we're talking about, that's kind of a technical term, but if this eccentricity number gets up to one, then we'd have a parabola for the uh, for the motion. And there are some objects in the solar system, comets, that travel on parabolas or even hyperbolas. So I hope you uh, enjoy those names. We're not going to delve into their motion too much. Talk about that again when we get to the comets. But for uh, this material, we're talking about planets that move on elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. For the case of the circle, the two foci are at the same point, at the center. Uh, for the case of a more general ellipse, we'll have a focus where the sun is. We'll have another focus where uh, it's empty space. So the shape is designated by the eccentricity. The size of the ellipse is designated by the semi-major axis. And traditionally, we use a small letter A for this. So the semi-major axis. The major axis is the longest line that you can draw in an ellipse. And it will have both foci on this line. Um, so from one end of the ellipse to the other, this is the longest distance I can create. That is the major axis. And the symbol A is half the length of the major axis. A is the semi-major axis. So there's our first law, Kepler's first law. The planets move on elliptical paths, and the uh, sun occupies one focus. Now, how is it possible that Ptolemy had some measure of success in predicting the positions of the planets using circles? Well, the, the planet orbits are not a lot different from circles. They're, they're more... Um, low values for ellipses rather than these high values. The, the study of the solar system with circles um, was able to give approximately correct results because to an, some approximation the orbits of the planets are, are nearly circular. Um, so there's our first law. Let's go to the second law. 
So with the second law, we take our sun here and we create an imaginary line from the sun to the planet at some starting time interval. We let the planet move for that time interval and we let this imaginary line sweep out an area. Uh, so this shaded in with the uh, letter A for area here. If we do this at another part of the orbit of the planet, so out here, and we use the same time interval, the area that's swept out by this imaginary line will be the same as this first area. And a third area out here where we have the, uh, the planet at a long distance away from the sun, then we get the uh, uh, smaller motion out here with the longer line here and a smaller motion out here. Again, this area will match this area. So Kepler found this again by uh, analyzing the data, uh, especially Mars was important as Kepler analyzed the material of Tycho's measurements. It's time to designate two more points in the ellipse. When the planet is near the sun, it's said to be at perihelion. This position close to the sun is perihelion. It's perilous to be close to the sun, so perihelion. When the planet is its longest distance away from the sun, then we have aphelion, aphelion. Now, I'd like you to take a look here at this pattern. When the, this imaginary line is short, the planet goes through more of an arc in its orbit. It's covering more distance here. When the line from the sun to the planet, this imaginary line is long, then the planet just moves a little bit along the arc of its orbit. So we have this uh, motion, fast motion at perihelion. We have slow motion for the planet near aphelion. Fast at perihelion, slow at aphelion. So Kepler's second law here is in agreement with a law of physics called the conservation of angular momentum, a long title. But in practical senses, if you uh, would observe an ice skater, ice skater spinning. As the ice skater pulls the arms in, the ice skater spins faster. That's somewhat uh, uh, similar to planets being close to the sun. The planet moves faster. Or a gymnast or a, a diver going into the water and doing somersaults. Um, if the diver tucks in the body, pulls the extremities towards the center of the body, then the diver spins faster. Um, and conversely, if the diver spreads out the arms or gymnast spreads out the arms, then there's a slower um, speed of rotation in that case. Um, you know, when I'm recording this, it's uh, 70 degrees out approximately. The uh, uh, time will come though in Nebraska when we have ice on the sidewalks. And if you can remember, what's your body's reaction if you slip on the sidewalk? I think you'll remember that your hands go outward, you kind of spread out, and that will slow down your body's rotation and give your body a chance to uh, get uh, feet back, from, back underneath you and prevent you from falling. So when things are spread out, the rotation is slow. When things are compact, the rotation is faster. Kepler's second law. Equal areas are swept out by this imaginary line from the sun to the planet if we have equal time intervals. So one month, one month, one month, and the motion is fast at perihelion, the planet moves slower at aphelion. There is a change in the speed of the planet as it orbits the sun. Um, now the third law, Kepler's third law. P squared equals A cubed. P squared equals A cubed is Kepler's third law. P is the period of the orbit in years. A is the semi-major axis in terms of astronomical units. P squared equals A cubed. It took Kepler quite a while to discover this law from the data. The first two laws were easier, uh, but this one, this mathematical relationship took a while to discover. But it is true for 
everything that orbits the sun and does not have rockets, some thrust, that the uh, period of the orbit, one uh, revolution around the sun, if we measure that in years and square it, that number will be equal to the size of the orbit measured in astronomical units raised to the third power. P squared equals A cubed. This will not work in another solar system around a different star. Um, it will not work for objects that orbit the Earth. Um, there are similar relationships, but uh, this one is for objects that orbit the Sun. Objects that orbit the Sun, P squared equals A cubed. P is the period of the orbit in years. That period is once around the Sun. And A is the semi-major axis, half of the longest uh, line you can put through the ellipse. So let's suppose we're told that the semi-major axis is three astronomical units. The semi-major axis is three astronomical units. Give some estimate of the period of this object. Well, p squared equals a cubed. We're given a, so I put a three in there. The cube means repeat the multiplication three times. So this p squared is three times three times three, and this three is the three that's inside the parentheses. So 3 times 3 is 9, 9 times 3 is 27, p squared is 27, and if you've memorized squares of numbers, you know, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25, 6 squared is 36, well, 5 is the closest match. And we are not going to uh, do detailed calculations with this, we'll just kind of estimate what the period is, so about 5 years. An object that has a semi-major axis of 3 astronomical units takes about five years for one orbit of the Sun. If we go the other way, suppose someone tells you that an object takes nine years for one orbit around the Sun, let's estimate the semi-major axis. So p squared equals a cubed, nine squared gives us 81 equals a cubed. Now we need, by trial and error, to find some number that when we cube it, we get something near to 81. Well, 2 cubed, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 3 cubed, 3 times 3 is 9, another 3 multiplied makes 27. That's still too low. 4 cubed, 4 times 4 times 4, we get 64. Still too low. 5 times 5 times 5, 125, and it's too high. And you can look at this, that we're, we're closer to the 64 side. So we're going to give an answer here that the semi-major axis is a little larger than four astronomical units. So p squared equals a cubed. We do approximate calculations. You do not need a, a calculator that will uh, do cubes and cube roots. Um, you should use a calculator if you have any doubts about this multiplication. Uh, but four cubed is 64. That's too small. 5 cubed is 125, that's uh, considerably too big. The, the value of the semi-major axis is in between these two numbers, and it's closer to 4 than 5, so a little bigger than 4 astronomical units. Um, and we'll do some uh, other examples of this in class. So we have Kepler's three laws. The first law, the planets orbit the Sun on elliptical paths with the Sun at one focus. The second law, planets sweep out equal areas in equal time, has the consequence that planets move fast at perihelion near the Sun. And p squared equals a cubed. We can easily find how long it takes the planet to go around the Sun if we're given the semi-major axis, or if we're given the time uh, in years to go around the Sun, we can estimate the size of the orbit. So I hope you practice with that a little bit. and. Uh, of course, keep reading. Here's a, a demonstration of this Kepler's third law. And again, the planets that are close to the sun uh, have a shorter period. A is small, then P will be smaller. And if you take a look at Mars, it's the outermost uh, planet in this diagram. It has the largest value for its semi-major axis, the size of its orbit, and it has the largest period. P squared equals A cubed. The period in years squared equals the semi-major axis measured in astronomical units cubed. 
So that's where we're going to, to stop here. And uh, hope you do keep on reading.